Hi, my name is Susie Kim. I'm a professor of Korean history at Rutgers University. In the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be sharing with you some of the examples and tools I've used in my classes to teach students how better to learn about North Korea. I start by showing you some examples of common myths and mainstream media representations of the country, and then move on to two particularly useful examples that illustrate how news stories and images can be taken out of context and used in distorted ways. So as you know, for much of the Cold War, North Korea was under the Soviet nuclear umbrella and didn't make headlines in the news. With the fall of the Soviet Union, however, North Korea began looking for ways to develop its own nuclear deterrent, and by 1993, the first nuclear crisis began the cycle of crises that has continued down to the present day. Since then, the most prevalent conception of North Korea is that it is a failed rogue state um, with an irrational, unpredictable leader starving his own people who are brainwashed with no freedoms. And basically what I'll be trying to do in the next 20 minutes is to complicate some of these myths um, by historicizing it and putting it into a larger global context. So this is um, the first myth is about the unpredictable, irrational leader. Um, and oftentimes um, what you'll see the most um, in media is um, are these giant, larger than life statues of the leaders, the kind of cult of personality around the leadership as a way to demonstrate um, the irrationality surrounding um, this worshiping of the leader. Um, and in many ways, beyond the images that come out of um, North Korea itself, um, popular culture can be also a very useful um, way to understand how North Korea is often represented um, outside of North Korea. And a particularly useful example um, recently was this one. Um, the interview was a film that was released by Sony Pictures in December of 2014. And while it was just a comedy and not all that original in portraying North Korea as the evil other, the film ended up causing a firestorm when it depicted the North Korean leader being blown up. The subtext being that what else can you do with the crazy leader who starves his own people? Um, and the corollary oftentimes to this idea that North Korea is ruled by an insane leader is that um, the crazy leader is able to maintain the kind of power that he does because North Korean people are brainwashed. And in order to demonstrate that, um, oftentimes the, the media um, shows images like this one. Uh, this one is of the mass games, what they call the mass games. Um, the mass games is most well known in North Korea today, but there are multiple examples of um, these kinds of giant gymnastic displays. Um, the, the Olympic opening ceremony, for example, oftentimes has these types of games. Um, where hundreds, if not thousands, of people are mobilized to um, conduct um, various sporting events or gymnastics. And, but in the North Korean case, um, what they also end up um, inserting is this, if you look at the insert, or the, the kind of the blown up image there, is, is that the, the entire back wall of the mosaic is actually um, done by children. Um, holding up uh, colored um, colored paper boards, basically to create the image that you see. And so um, you can imagine how much effort goes into doing that sort of thing. And people assume that, um, or people outside of North Korea assume that North Korean people must be brainwashed in order to do these sorts of things. And another, um, another prevalent image is this image of North Korean soldiers marching. Um, but of course, soldiers marching is not necessarily unique to North Korea either, because as this example shows, um, oftentimes, whether it's a national holiday or Memorial Day or um, in honor of you know veterans um, of various wars, there will be um, soldiers marching um, for various events, um, this one particular being from the United States. So what I'd like to emphasize is that North Korea is rarely examined in this way of sort of in comparative context with um, other countries. Um, and what I'll do in the next um, 
couple of examples is to illustrate some of the common methods of analysis and interpretation um, that we can use as a way to dispel some of the conventional myths about North Korea. So the first example is a news story that broke in 2012 that made North Korea again the butt of many jokes and a laughing stock for seeming delusional and crazy with outlandish claims. Um, the Guardian was just one among many news outlets that circulated the story about how North Korea discovered a unicorn lair. The story was actually based on a press release by North Korea's own central news agency. And here is an excerpt from that original um, published in English um, upon which some of these other news um, was based. So there are North Korean news websites with their own perspective, and yet, um, and these are um, very readily available online, and yet these are rarely consulted to learn more about North Korea. So what this example does is to, um, what you can do with this particular example is to um, use it to teach students about the importance of checking multiple sources. And as a class exercise, you can circulate this press release as a primary document to see if students can tease out clues on how better to understand the Guardian story. Once the students have had a chance to read um, the story on their own, that, that is the North Korean original story, or work in groups to come up with clues about how to interpret um, this whole um, discovery of the unicorn lair, you can have a discussion about um, how better to understand the story in a way that makes sense without making North Korea seem like it's a crazy place. So here I've underlined some of the important points that could have led um, any careful reader of the original North Korean article to conclude um, that largely what the story is trying to do is to say that archaeologists discovered an ancient site um, with words referring to unicorn lair carved in the rocks which are based on ancient texts that associated the legend of King Dongmyeong with Pyongyang as the ancient capital of the Koguryo Kingdom, which is dated to more than 20 or 2,000 years ago. So if you, if you look at the underlying pieces and sort of focus on those points, um, what the piece of news about the, what, the, what this reveals is that the, what, um, the news is really about an archaeological discovery that gave Pyongyang legitimacy as the ancient capital of Korea, rather than Seoul in South Korea. In other words, sort of North Korea trying to demonstrate that it has a greater historical legitimacy than its rival in the South. You can go a step further to question how the article might have, writ might have been written in the original Korean. Um, that is to say, what was the word, the Korean word for um, unicorn? The word used in Korean was kidding or giraffe, or what in present day um, Korean is understood to be the giraffe. Um, the, that particular word in Korean is a derivative of the Chinese um, word chilin. And chilin was a mythical animal described as a maned creature with the torso of a deer, as you see here, a tail of an ox, and the hooves of a horse. The Kirin in Korean art is often depicted as more deer-like. Um, it was regarded as one of the four divine creatures along with the dragon, the phoenix, and the turtle. Um, and um, this particular figure was extensively used in Korean royal and Buddhist arts, which is not surprising then that you find a carving about a reference to this in this archeological discovery in North Korea. The name of the mythical creature then may have been applied to a real giraffe when one was introduced to China in 1414 by a Bengali envoy um, who gave the giraffe as a tribute to the emperor of Ming China at the time. Um, and this example that you see here is um, a commissioned painting by the emperor, um, painted by Shen Du, um, who, who's painting this giraffe that was brought to China. Um, and since the giraffe is not native to China, you could imagine that people were quite sort of, um, they, they thought it was a novelty to see this new creature and they might have associated the name of this mythical creature to this um, giraffe. Others have hypothesized that the Arabian oryx, um, a desert antelope, may have sparked the legend of the um, Kidin in East Asia. 
So the lesson here is simple. It is that the importance of language and historical context um, really makes a huge difference in understanding a particular um, story. Um, and um, ne the need to account for mis mistranslations and cross-cultural misunderstandings whenever we are dealing with a society other than our own, and how easy it is to label the unfamiliar as crazy and insane without considering how better to understand it. The next example comes from an image that has been widely circulated since it was first introduced. Um, in the U.S. Department of Defense briefing in, on North Korea in the early 2000s. Since then, this image, which you might have already seen, has been widely used um, to imply that North Korea is not only poor, but it's a failed rogue state on the brink of collapse. But important, to, again, question is how is an image like this created? Well, um, NASA, um, it, the image has been captured by satellites um, from NASA, and it's captured um, in a nighttime view of the Korean Peninsula. Um, but if you look at the explanation from NASA about how this image is captured, it basically talks about the need to adjust for not only daylight, um, but city lights, city lights, gas flares, um, wildfires, or reflected moonlight. In other words, other kinds of light that can get in the way of capturing this needs to be filtered out. Um, and what's helpful about looking at this particular image is that um, you see the, the, the part marked with the box. And with the kind of light that it has there, you might assume, you know, compared to other places like Japan or South Korea or China, that it's another landmass. But but it's actually not a landmass. It's actually lights from fishing boats in the Yellow Sea. And so if you don't account for that, then you can see how um, you can expect the image could be very well distorted. So what I do then, after I explain to the students about how these images are created, I show students this image. And I ask them, you know, can they guess where this is? And it takes, them, it takes most students a couple of minutes, but they usually figure out that it's the continental United States. Um, and the image, it's obviously much more sort of sporadic, but the image is based on a similar kind of low light imaging um, of the earth at night. And it's controlled for the same kind of, you know, sunlight, gas flares, and that sort of thing. Um, and this one, is one of the earliest um, images made of the United States using lights detected in 29 orbits around um, the Earth. And compare that to this one, which is obviously, which is much more obviously the continental United States. Um, and, and I usually ask students, you know, how, how many orbits do you think this would have taken? Um, and it's 10 times the number of orbits it would have taken um, from the previous image. So this this image takes 236 orbits to create, um, and it takes about six months for the satellite to capture enough um, data, in, enough light data to be able to create this image. And here's another one. So the lesson in this case can be a couple of points. Technological manipulation is necessary to produce the kinds of images we see. So it's important to inquire into how images are constructed and towards what ends. And secondly, this exercise can spark another conversation about the consumption of electric power and what it means globally. Rather than just associating plentiful electricity with prosperity, students today can be especially sensitive to environmental issues. And this slide, I think, is particularly helpful in getting students to think about the unequal distribution of energy and resources, which often translates into um, unequal power in international relations. If you compare North Korea here with the other parts of the world where the lowest levels of um, electricity are consumed, you can see that um, North Korea basically is in the company of South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In other words, it's, it's much of the third world with a history of colonization. In the Korean case, and especially in understanding the history of relations between North Korea and the United States, um, 
It's also important to talk about the history of the Korean War, which is remarkably unknown for the devastation that it caused. Um, the American air campaigns against North Korea wiped out almost all industrial and urban centers. Um, and uh, during the Korean War, there was a threat of American use of nuclear weapons. And um, since that time, North Korea has been consistently um, quite um, concerned about basically not having a comparable nuclear deterrent, especially with the collapse of the Soviet bloc and no longer having the, the Soviet nuclear umbrella. Um, and despite the Korean War being such a formative experience for North Korea even today, um, it's, um, it's, it's not an episode that is widely known even among historians. So just to give you some basic sort of uh, background information about the war, the war claimed over 4 million lives, um, you know, including both uh, South, North Koreans um, and Chinese and other international um, soldiers fighting in North Korea, in fighting in Korea, uh, which included 10% of the North Korean population over the course of the three years from 1950 to 1953. Um, and it, and, and that makes it one of the deadliest conflicts in modern history. Um, by 1952, according to estimates uh, made by you know, nor, uh, American fighter pilots, there were no more targets left standing in the North for them to bomb. By the war's end, the war had claimed on average at least one member from every North Korean family. Um, and as a result, um, its nuclear ambitions or its suspicion of outsiders and foreign influence really need to be understood within this context of, of a North Korea that really still sees itself very much in a state of war. The costs are not limited to international relations, but extends to the North Korean people who must live in a constant state of alert. Um, North Korea has one of the longest conscription stints in the world at 10 years of man mandatory military service for almost all men who meet physical and background requirements. But one of the results of the bombing was that cities became blank canvases upon which to build a modern city from scratch. Uh, Pyongyang became one of the most modern cities in Asia in the 1960s, and pictures like this could be mistaken for Seoul, um, if you didn't look very closely. Um, and North Korea grew far more rapidly than, than the South after the war from the 1950s to the 1970s. But despite um, getting a lot of um, aid from the Soviet bloc in order to rebuild North Korea, the emphasis still very much remained about self-reliance or Chuche. And you might have heard about the Chuche ideology from North Korea in the media. Um, this particular word, Chuche, um, is not uh, it's not a new word that was created by the leader. Um, it was first used by the North Korean leader, um, the first North Korean leader, Kim Il-sung, in 1955, but it was very much used throughout um, Korea's colonial period um, as a way to denote independence, along with other words that denoted independence, um, like Chaju or Charyeok. Um, it becomes an official ruling ideology, though, after it's mentioned by the leader, and it becomes a kind of a form of North Korean nationalism. And you see here in the photo um, the Chuche Tower, or the Tower of Chuche Idea. And some anecdotes basically talk about how even in the worst times economically in North Korea, when the entire city would be in a blackout, the Tower of Chuche remained lit as a symbol that you know it, it would still remain um, self-reliant no matter what the costs. Um, and this is one of the major reasons why um, it has been reluctant to completely open up to foreign aid, um, despite it having um, economic hardships. And it's also one of the reasons why it has maintained sort of a staunch independence line, um, even playing Russia or the Soviet Union at the time and China against each other throughout the Cold War. So one of the, another of the greatest myths um, today that China has the power to make North Korea do whatever it wants because of its um, economic power is, is patently false if you look at um, the dynamic between the two countries today. Um, and the most um, visible and obvious kind of um, 
um, example of that is the fact that North Korea has maintained its nuclear program, a uh, nuclear weapons program, despite China's disapproval. Uh, the principle of self-reliance is also reflected in the national emblem that you see here. Um, it has the name of the official name of it of the country, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in Korean. But you'll also see in the emblem that there's um, grain um, and hydroelectric power. In other words, energy and agricultural or food self-sufficiency. That This is an emblem that was created back in the 1940s when the country was first founded in 1948. And already um, at its very foundation, it was thinking about the importance of self-reliance. So the last myth um, that I'm going to talk about is this one about North Korea. Um, I mean, in some ways, largely due to its own insistence on self-reliance and chuche, um, but the idea that North Korea is completely closed off as a hermit kingdom and that it's one of the poorest countries in the world on the brink of collapse. While there's no doubt that it is one of the most controlled societies and access to internet and travel are extremely limited um, for most North Koreans, North Korea does engage in international and inter-Korean trade and there are joint ventures going on. Um, and uh, according to some sort of statistical indicators, North Korea does somewhat better than the poorest countries in the world. So according to UN agency reporting, um, North Korean children were better off than children living in other Asian countries such as India and Indonesia, as you see here. Um, the malnutrition ra rates um, in terms of wasting or stunting um, were North Korea did better than India and Indonesia. And in terms of infant mortality, um, North Korea also does better than um, the average for South Asia. Um, and it's obviously not as good as it's um, South Korea or the United States or China, but it's by no means sort of at the bottom of, of the indicators in terms of infant mortality um, either. And then in terms of trade and joint ventures, um, Pyonghua Motors uh, Company, um, which was started by a South Korean-based unification church in 1999, ran a factory in North Korea to produce domestic cars although there were reports that it may have closed back in 2012. This photo shows a billboard advertising one of the cars produced by the joint venture in which the North Korean government is a 30% partner. Um, whereas smuggled phones from China used to be used along the border um, before 2008, um, since 2008, Cordial Link was established as North Korea's official um, cellular network. It's also a joint venture with an Egyptian firm, um, Orascom, which owns 75% of the company and 25% owned by the North Korean state. And the latest data shows that there are 3 million um, subscribers. Um, users are not able to make outside um, international calls and there is no internet access, but you know, as you see in the picture here, it's a very common sight now to see people with their phones um, all over, particularly in Pyongyang. North Korea may have come closest to collapse in the mid-90s and the years just after the fall of the Soviet bloc, when the only leader that it had known suddenly died, there were major weather disasters um, that compounded the already dire economic situation, and then there was this terrible famine that happened. And obviously, it is far from a major player in the global economy today, but it's not, um, these examples show that it's not a hermetically sealed hermit kingdom either. And in fact, the borders between North Korea and China um, based, allowed the majority of the North Korean defectors to leave North Korea to eventually settle in South Korea because the, the natural border is created by a river that runs through there and when the water levels are low enough, people are able to bribe the border patrols and cross the river on foot. Um, as of 2013, the total number of North Korean refugees in South Korea was at 23,000 um, people. Um, with the majority, as you see in this graph, with the majority leaving um, after the late 1990s. Um, and by, if you look at the survey data, 
the majority of them will say that it was for economic reasons. Um, but again, um, it's important to put this figure into perspective. So North Korea so far, there are 23,000 North Koreans settled in South Korea um, since the, the division of Korea. But um, to put this into perspective, 21,000 East Germans left every year um, while the Berlin Wall stood during the Cold War. And by the end of that, there were 4.5 million East Germans who had settled in West Germany uh, by the time of unification. So the numbers for the defection of North Koreans pale by comparison. And uh, obviously you can think about various reasons for that, but so to recap, um, the major lessons to impart to students are the importance of Korean historical and cultural context and the importance of looking at North Korea not in isolation, but in comparative and global contexts. Although it can be daunting to wade through the endless numbers of materials online, students can make effective use of internet sources with a strict standard for critically assessing their value. As I always say to my students, to approach something with understanding is not the same as sympathizing with it. And I hope you have found these examples useful in teaching students about North Korea. Thank you.